introduction. Uh, uh, my name is Ben Fenner, and my background is in experiment psychology and user-centered research. So I'm really interested in uh, digitally enabled services to improve healthcare and society, and the technologies to support them. So this focus has led me to some interesting places. So I started working uh, at Vodafone, and I set up their global user research and planning function. So it was an interesting time because increasingly people were carrying around extremely powerful computers in their pockets and we had to understand the context in which they were being used. So my concern became how we build technology in a user-centered way, but also the opportunities to be culturally, contextually and personally relevant for people, plus avoiding the risks by which the technology gets in the way of people being able to do the things that they want to do, taking control away from them. So, um, I want to share with you some of the work that we've done working with vulnerable patients, some of the user-centered work that we've done with disenfranchised patients, and I'm also here to talk about the opportunity to support shared decision-making. But I want you to leave here understanding the opportunity, what we want to do in the UK in partnership, but also the way in which we can systemically change the way shared decision-making happens in the UK. So helping me today will be Dr. Georgie Phillips, one of our team in, in London, and um, she's going to focus on the, the UK-specific situation. So I'll get to the meat of the topic in a, in a minute, but as a way of introducing myself and some of the things that have informed For Health, I want to give you a background on a few projects. So first, as the founder of uh, Eclipse Experience, I created mechanisms and tools which are now open sourced and shared under Creative Commons to engage local communities in rapid onset emergency situations. Secondly, created Fora Health as an organization specifically to create personalized medicine at scale for individuals. And thirdly, Cognition Kit, a way to assess cognition accurately using people's mobile technology. So each of these have influenced Fora Health's design. So what became user-centered community engagement actually started out on the streets of Stanmore in North London. We worked out a way of getting a, um, a, an experience of a service out to people in the streets that had low numeracy needs, low literacy needs, and get them to interact and give feedback. We took this content and their feedback on what a service, a library service in Harrow could do and then engage people in a co-production um, uh, work together with architects and designers to understand how that service could work best for them. The output of the research became the only thing shared by Stanmore Council with the designers and architects to build the new service. The bones of this became user-centered community engagement. We took this back to Save the Children. We took it to the Humanitarian Innovation Fund and told them it was a way that we could engage local affected communities in the design of services to meet their needs. Broadly speaking, the process involved uh, an engaging way in which end users could interact in local language, rolled out by local people, a way in which you could take the content and their needs and take it into a co-production exercise, a way of understanding the output of that co-production exercise and pragmatically deciding what you do. This can be completed in 10 days in a rapid onset emergency situation in local language. Oh. Clickers. <laughs> this is Harrow Library. Is it finished? And this is the um, the, the process we built with user centered community engagement. We've rolled this out in Bangladesh. Um, we've rolled this out in, in Iraq, in, in Kurdistan, uh, with Save the Children. We've also rolled this out in uh, the Somali region of, uh, of Ethiopia, in the north. Um, each of which has engaged with communities. So we're talking about uh, a million Rohingya Muslims who, that have kind of fleed the, the persecution in Myanmar. We're talking about the Yadizi community in Kurdistan in northern Iraq. We're talking about um, here in, in Ethiopia, in Somalia. This is a child interacting with a touchscreen device together in, in local language. And this is a, a co-production exercise happening with women running the co-production facility for, for children. We also rolled out in Bolivia, and we've just now rolled out um, uh, also in, in Lima, in Peru. So the thing that we learned from this is the importance to engage a diverse group of people, marginalized individuals in local language, and get them to share ideas 
which are relevant for them. We've also seen the, the value of a discursive process, one that encourages people to speak, engineers, WASH engineers who have the expertise in the engineering and the water, sanitation and hygiene facilities, but individuals who are experts in their own needs. So Control Group was my first foray into digitally enabled healthcare. So as you see, um, what we tried to do in this slightly gory illustration is understand the complexity at play, the different actors at play in healthcare situations. To understand the physiology, the context and the interaction of the dizzying array of people involved in healthcare. We did lots of user-centered research, ethnographic research, working together with patients and care teams to understand their individual needs and the complexity of the situation. As a business, we focused on how individuals are different from the categories that they belong. We focused on the huge variety of backgrounds and situations people are in, people with Alzheimer's, people with COPD, heart disease, diabetes, depression using mobile technology as a tool to research together with them. And we built engaging experiences that could work for, for individuals in their local environment, understanding their context. So what we learned from this is the power and opportunity to have a tool in people's own pockets, which empowers them to make decisions for themselves and doesn't look to block the decisions they make, but also to navigate in a way that is mindful of the personally identifiable information they share the data that's created and puts people in charge of that data themselves. So one of these things, focusing on building rich experiences of people in context, led to the creation of Cognition Kit. So Cognition Kit is a company, it's a joint venture with Cambridge Cognition. We focus here on the creation of validated tools to measure cognition in the real world, build up a rich picture of what people could do. Created two tools to date, an NBAC and a DSST looking to validate both of these against gold standard measures. Both of them able to be completed on patients' own devices in around 60 seconds. So with the DSST, for instance, we validated this against the Pearson Waste 4. It's a pencil and paper test that's been used for 30 years in clinical research and in healthcare. And what we found is the results of our DSST correlated highly with the Pearson Waste 4, but also satisfied patients able to use it without having to go into a clinic, without having oversight from a clinical team, and being able to complete on a patient's own device in 60 seconds. So what we learned from this is vital to be able to collect relevant health information. But we'd anticipated that this tool was used not just in clinical research to look at side effects, but also to be used in healthcare to help improve treatment efficacy. What we found out from Cognition Kit is although we can create the tools, what's really important is have the content from the output of the tools used in a way that supports something. And all of these have fed into Fora Health. So what I'm here to talk about today in terms of Fora Health is treatment choice. The way we can listen to a patient as being an expert on themselves, using the technology, the content and the data already available and delivering personal health care to individuals and giving patients a seat at the table where treatment decisions are being made. So hopefully this is all common sense so far. But we have to understand that this is historically challenging. There's lots of things historically that have got in the way of the patient and the clinician interaction. And still technologies that are being created all the time that take power away from the individual. What we're challenging here is and what we're trying to do in Fora Health is to support the dialogue, support the collaborative care model, and support shared decision making. We do so in a way which engages the patients, a conversational interface, digitally inclusive, easy to use on a patient's own device, sharing relevant health information and getting it to the care team in a place they use it, so integrated into the EMR through Smart on Fire. But first of all, I thought it would be useful to take a little bit of a step back to understand why some of these ideas that would hopefully seem common sense to us all are historically challenging. So we look at recent history and we understand how countercultural some of these things are. They're countercultural because they take power away from a clinician being able to make a decision themselves. They are a medical expert, but they are not an expert in all things. They're not an expert in all patients. So a couple of things to remind ourselves of here. 
First of all, 1969 patient care model, placing the patient in the attention of the care, not the care that's being delivered. So the, you know, the biopsychosocial model built out after that, thinking of the patient in a more complex way, thinking about the physiology of the patient, thinking about the psychology of the patient, but also thinking about the context they're in, their own context and the social context, followed by Tuckett. So this is 1985, who outlined the role played by the patient having a wealth of experience in themselves, talking to a clinician who has a wealth of experience on clinical efficacy. Ultimately, a meeting between experts. So, Kathy Charles comes along in 1997, and she proves it is possible to get a good title through peer-reviewed um, scientific work, something I've not managed to do myself. So, it, it takes at least two to tango, and she sets out the, 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 the structure of shared decision-making. Physicians and patients involve, both parties share information, both parties take steps to build consensus, and agreement is reached. No, it doesn't say that the patient makes the decision about the treatment. It says the patient works with the clinician to make a decision about the treatment. So Professor Glenn Elwin builds on this. He makes the distinction between motivational interviewing, essentially someone already deciding what's best for you and then convincing you that that thing's going to be best for you, and discursive um, discussion, so collaborative, deliberative model. This is the three-talk model from, Dr. from Professor um, Elwin in 2014. So he goes on to build with this, with, with lots of others, building on the, the model, involving a wider group of stakeholders, not just, the, not just the patients, not just a single clinician, but thinking also about the type of decisions that should be informed in this way. So decisions where there is a, a, a number of reasonable choices, like genuine equipoise, what work might work best for you, might not work best for me. And because the appropriateness of the decision is genuinely sensitive to the preference of the individual. So Professor Elwin goes on to um, work at the Dartmouth Institute where he now works. He's the chair of the co-chair of the, the Institute of Health Policy and Research uh, at Dartmouth Institute, and we work with Dartmouth now. He also went on to create Option Grid, high quality decision aid content, typically put into the hands of doctors, but can, as we'll show later, be put into the hands of patients. He created these decision aids and they're now um, kept up to, up, up to date by an editorial board at EBSCO in the US. We also use this content in poor health. But we know we're, we're still faced with this huge problem, that whilst there are little pockets of shared decision making going on, this has not systemically changed the way it works, despite the fact it, it, it makes common sense to do so. But worryingly, we also know that services that are designed that don't take into the needs of a diverse group of users and are inclusive by nature, both in output and design, risk exacerbating a situation where health equities already exist. So, I mean, the, 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 the numbers are shocking. Professor Michael Marmot talks about the um, the um, life expectancy in the difference between the life expectancy in um, in where well, I'll remind myself now between Hackney and the West End is the same as the difference in life expectancy between the UK and Guatemala. This is 11 years of difference. So Stephen Armstrong, in his book about the new poverty, talks about losing a year of life expectancy as you travel around the tube line from Putney to Olgate East. So it says there are material differences in the way healthcare is delivered to individuals that change people's lives in the UK. But we also know that lots of people are using mobile phones. So increasingly, from my early days at, uh, uh, at Vodafone, the, the power in people's pockets has is, is, is grown exponentially. And the use of this technology is, is, is continuing to grow. And it's not, this is in numbers from the US, but also not just young, young people, but elder adults. So um, Ofcom talked about the the, the, the decade of digital inclusivity. So over 55s using their smartphones for more than two hours a day. We've also got data from an accountable care organization with, uh, called Advocate Aurora Healthcare in Illinois. So what they see is a, a huge number of people, it's, the numbers have increased, so 14% of people in, in the US, adults in the US um, with major depressive disorder. We're talking about most of these people being treated through primary care, a lot of pressure on those primary care experience, people leaving on the default option, which is to take an SSRI, an antidepressant treatment, and people not responding to antidepressant treatment, so non-remitting apart from 25%. 
So we're talking about 7.5% of the adult population with untreated depression, a huge number of people. And for those people, the cost of treating those people is double if they have a comorbidity and mental health difficulties. So this, for the numbers of Advocate Aurora Healthcare in Illinois, $7,000 per year for every patient with untreated depression and also has COPD or heart disease, so a huge opportunity space. And we know from the literature and our own research that better shared decision making leads to more engaged patients, better treatment adherence, better self-management, better patient satisfaction, and a consequent reduction in healthcare costs. So this is the world that we look to support. And I want to tell you a little bit about For Health and how it works. So at the heart of this, we've got a four-stage shared decision-making process. Patients prepare for the decision with the content available to them on their own device. They make a shared decision together with their care team. They adjust to that treatment. If it works for them, they stay on that treatment. If it doesn't work for them, they can try something else, again, through a shared decision. I'll give you the example in depression. So in Advocate Aurora Healthcare, when a patient comes in with a major depressive disorder diagnosis, rather than trying to cram so much into that appointment, the patient can leave with a link to that program on Fora Health. The doctor says to the patient, download the app, talk to it, share your relevant health information. It will tell you what treatment options you have available to you. It will allow you to review those in your own time. It will allow you to record your PHQ-9, your adherence, your, the side effects of your current medication. I will see all of that information in my electronic health record. When we meet again, we can have an informed conversation and make a shared decision together, and then you can try that treatment out and see if it works for you, and we can cycle again. So just showing how this works, we talk about intuitive, digitally inclusive conversational indicators. We're talking about working with elder adults, we're talking about working with non-digital natives, we're talking about very easy to use conversational intervals. We've done hundreds of hours of research together with patients and clinicians around the, the, this. So you can see it introduces itself, it tells you who it is, it tells you it's going to remember everything you tell it, it asks you your name, it chats away with you, it can adjust the speed and language according to the settings on your phone. Treatment options. This is a patient with depression. These are your treatment options for depression. This is the clinical efficacy of these different treatment options. These are the side effects associated with these different treatment options. These are the risks associated with these different treatment options. This is what else you need to know. This is the information you can talk to your family about at home, asynchronously, away from the clinical encounter. Review this in your own time. Indicate your preference, your reasons why, and track relevant health information that I, as your doctor, would like to see. Those treatment preferences, when made, then are available to the care team. This can prompt an appointment where the, the care team sees them, but the appointment is informed by the relevant health information that the patient has collected plus their treatment preferences. So the, the doctor and clinical team are, are, are ready to receive this information, but also the patient is prepared and engaged in their own treatment. The shared decision making can be attested to by both parties. Attestation of shared decision making is a higher form of consent. Patient has seen the information, patient has read the information, patient has a preference for information, doctor and patient have had a conversation about this. Decision, uh, treatment is, is decided on, treatment is attested to as a higher form of consent. Patient can then track the extent to which that treatment is working for them. So for depression care, PHQ-9. They can track their PHQ-9 within the app. They can track their adherence to medication. They can track any side effects, the tolerability of those side effects within the app. And the whole time, they're supported by relevant information to support key behaviors. What is shared decision making? Why should I engage with it? Why should I um, uh, adhere to my treatment? Um, what, what can I do to better prepare for appointments? Engaging the patient through this in, uh, engaging uh, graphic content. So I didn't learn much from Cathy Charles about snappy titles, so ours isn't, ours isn't very good. But what we did learn from this recent study in Illinois is that patients do use the app. Clinical teams do review the information. There was high satisfaction of use from both parties. They actually gave us some pointers because this was early work that we did about tweaking a little bit the way we do visit preparation, changing the way we do EMR integration a little bit. Those changes have taken in hand. We're now finishing a 200-person year-long study in Advocate Aurora Healthcare on the 
on the 21st of January, which we'll be able to publish. We've also deployed with the American Academy of Family Physicians. We've deployed in two rare diseases, and we're um, deploying in a federally supported community care institute in Illinois in March next year. So we also found in this study, in the six months following use of the app, in the app arm compared to the non-intervention arm, there was a 40% reduction in the use of primary care facilities by those individuals. People engaged in their own treatment, made a shared decision, tracking their health within the app, but not using primary care facilities as much as the non-intervention group. So all this said, bizarrely, we're a UK company, we're based down the road in Old Street. Why all of our work is in the US? We found really good partners in the US, but we're determined to look at the situation from a UK point of view because we can configure our platform for UK needs. And that's why Georgie's been on board with us as a team member. We also work with Glenn Elwin in the US. And I'll hand over to Georgie to tell you a little bit more about what we're finding out about how Fora Health could be used in the UK. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak today. Um, so. As someone who's um, been both a patient, a, a nurse assistant, and a doctor in the NHS, I see far too many patients left completely confused after information has been given to them by their care teams. And there's, there's not enough time or um, necessarily confidence with the patient to have meaningful conversations with their doctors about things that matter most. So I constantly see shared decision making being something that's really essential um, to implement. And in the context of shorter and shorter appointment times and increasing workload, it's really essential that we're kind of changing tact on the way we do things here. So there's been um, a lot of cases of kind of predictable preference sensitive decisions in, in many care pathways um, within the NHS. And actually we can use shared decision making to better optimize resources and, and give patients the best treatments that work for them. So thankfully, the NHS and um, the UK landscape has actually clocked onto this in the last two to three years. So first, we've got um, alongside the long-term plan, um, which stipulates better care personalization and digital transformation. We've got the COVID-19 pandemic, which actually um, led to a strategy of how we're going to defeat that kind of elective um, treatment backlog. Um, three of the things that they actually said as a main goal that they want to achieve is improving decision support for patients, providing more personalized information um, for patients, and actually giving rapid data feedback to kind of drive decisions um, that we do in the NHS. And secondly, we've got the GMC, the General Medical Council, that regulates all doctors in the UK. So it's stated that actually an exchange of information um, between doctor and patient is essential and actually serious harm can, can result if patients aren't listened to and if they're not giving the information they need. So it's a must in a lot of the activities that doctors should be doing. And finally, NICE released some really nice guidance in June 2021 about how to implement shared decisions um, within organizations, which gives some really nice gravitas to why this is important at the moment. So I think a good case to start with as a use case is actually to support decisions for patients with depression. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic obviously had a huge impact on the rates of low mood within the UK. But thankfully, people are going to their GPs um, to get help with this. But despite this, we know that a GP appointment and probably everyone here lasts about 9.2 minutes. Okay, so there's too much information to get between doctor and patient in that time. And actually, if we rush decisions and you know, explanations about diagnosis, treatment options, what matters to the patients, um, you know, questions, it's going to lead to poor care satisfaction for both patients and doctors. Um, and actually, it's going to lead to potentially more dangerous practice and less efficient use of um, treatment resources. So this means doctors and patients both need to make use, um, better use of that time they have for them. So Fora Health is in a good position, um, in my opinion, to support patients who are diagnosed with depression in general practice. So as an adaptation of our US program, um, we see it working in the UK as follows. So first, the GP um, diagnoses the patient with depression and sends them an SMS um, with the link to download the Fora Health app. Second, um, the patient either goes away from the appointment to consider their treatment options um, at home, asynchronously and remotely, um, or if the patient is prescribed a treatment or referred for a talking therapy in that appointment, we can do two things. So if a med medication is prescribed, Fora Health will actually um, track medication adherence and symptoms, um, side effects and actually patient reported outcome measures and packages all of that data succinctly and really nicely to be sent back to the clinician portal and automatically into the EPR where it can be documented. Next, if a patient is referred on a waiting list um, for talk therapy, the patient can use Fora Health um, to consider uh, other treatment options whilst they're on that often six week waiting list. 
Um, or they can use it to monitor whether that talk therapy is actually wait, you know, working for them or whether we need to stick and twist their options. So all of this data, as I said, is packaged up and it's sent to the clinician portal. So we're EPR integrated with Epic, um, and it's very similar with the other portals as well. And clinicians can really quickly document this information. So I can prove that my patients have interacted with that information and we've made a shared decision and that we're ready to go with this treatment. So, you know, often um, we're, we're having, you know, a situation with lots of locum GPs and different GPs seeing patients. So rather than having that conversation all over again in another appointment where the patient might get a little bit annoyed with that, you know, we can actually keep everyone up to date and, and actually make some progress with these patients. So For Health um, then uh, reminds patients to, to book in any um, treatment reviews that aren't booked automatically in GPs, and this is incentivized by QOF payments. And finally, the patient app also automates this data collection, so no admin teams or GPs need to be sending these questionnaires to patients. The patient app just remote, remotely nudges you to do it. So in summary, we've got better personalized care. We've got improved clinician and patient satisfaction. We've got cost saving and cost releasing. If we don't end up using particular treatments um, by default, we're actually you know, getting patients on better adherence. And hopefully this can make both parties better, better prepared for every appointment, making the time um, more efficient. And what's really nice is that we've got some great content um, for decision support already existing in the UK. But actually, in my opinion, the, the limitations of these is that they're often paper-based tools, okay? So they're not getting in the hands of everyone that needs them. They're online, but we don't know about them as doctors. And um, they're often not really kept completely up to date as we would do with a kind of online um, option grid that we would use, or we can kind of integrate UK content. So the next um, and my final point is that, you know, how are we going to train clinicians to actually do shared decision making? Because it's something that we currently have e-learning modules available for. But my argument is, is that, you know, I was so impressed when I saw the technology initially because it's a step-by-step -step process that really easily guides both patient and doctor through the process. So um, it's kind of naturally intuitive about um, how you then make the shared decision. But I'll hand over to Ben and, and thanks for letting me um, talk today. Thanks, Georgie. So um, my hope is that we can engage in the UK in a collaborative way, in the same way that we engage in a collaborative way with our partners in the US. So here we have commercial partners interested in people getting onto the right treatment for them. We have technology partners who can gather relevant bits of content but also integrate it with the EMR. So we work with Epic, we work with Lumion, we can take Cognition Kit, what I mentioned earlier, and, and assess Cognition within the app. We work with hospital systems. These are generally they're accountable care organizations so they have a similar end-to-end -end responsibility as we do in the NHS but also we're in GDPR, we're HIPAA, we're SOC 2 compliant and the whole thing was built by ISO 13485 so software as a medical device. We integrate, what did I miss one? So um, we can take content from EBSCO. So they have an editorial board that keeps content up to date across 80 different preference sensitive treatment areas. We can also use high quality content. The Winton Center and Professor Spiegelhalter um, have created some very high quality decision aid content. We can take any of this content in and inform those decisions. We've deployed two pathways in depression. So the evidence built over the years has taken us about three years to build up. We've worked um, collaboratively with these organizations doing hundreds of hours of user-centered research, smaller deployments, building evidence, bigger deployments, EMR integration. The basic tools that we've created now can be reconfigured into an any, any number of different care pathways to support different preference-sensitive treatment decisions. We're rolling out in, in heart health. We've rolled out twice in rare disease already. We're looking at long COVID, but there are huge opportunities, as George is already talking about, in the UK talking about screening, we're talking about elective surgery, we're talking about people on waiting lists or waiting to see a doctor to have those first conversations. And we can reconfigure any of these elements. We can pull all of these elements in. So we talked about tracking PROs, we talked about adherence to medical regimes, we talked about different guides, talked about different content. So we can build programs specific to different treatment areas, specific to different hospital groups, specific to different groups, and deploy them all on for health. The EMR is completely configurable as well. So we can take different content and we can summarize it to the top. We can create alerts based on content coming in and send them to individuals via SMS or email. 
we can allow you to screen and we can automate the invites so you can invite groups of people based on kind of um, triggers uh, people coming to a certain age, people have left hospital having had a heart attack, people have got a clinical diagnosis of major depressive disorder. So whilst the invite can come from an individual clinician, which is important to support that, that conversation, we can also automate the invitations for this. And that's what we want to do with 4Health. It's fully configurable. We want to work with individuals in the UK. That's why we're here, to start collaborations, to work with trusts. So our hope is that for a health in a patient-centric, inclusive, empowering way, we're able to play some part in systemically changing the way decision-making happens in the UK for treatments. So the scene is set. Patients have the phones in their own pocket. Content is available, although it's not usually given directly to patients at the minute. There's the weight of legal argument with shared decision-making as a higher form of consent, and evidence is building around efficacy and cost savings. And that's what we want to do. We want to collaborate in the UK. We want to have a, a range of trials where we build evidence together with our partners. We're applying for grant funding. There's amazing grants uh, starting to emerge, Innovate UK, NIHR grants. But we're self-funded ourselves, but we'll also go to the market for the first time. Uh, we're, we're a fully bootstrapped organization uh, and have been since the start. We're, we're profitable, but in order to scale, we're going to go to the market and raise some investment in January this year. And that's it, hoping we can work together to involve patients in the treatment choices that affect their lives. Um, we've got more information downstairs, we're at M5 on the booth, so please come down if you want to see a demo, or if you have any other questions now, we'd be happy to answer. We've got just one, two minutes for a question or two. Any questions for anybody? Yes, here we go. Hi, thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, I'm working in a field just now which is looking at severe mental illness and cardiovascular disease and in particular protection from getting cardiovascular disease and the risk factors. So this is really interesting yeah. to me. And I'm also being trained in user research as well, so uniting two things. Yeah. My question relates to scalability, which was coming up earlier in yeah. the talks. It was really fascinated how you were talking about Eclipse and it started in the UK and then it went around lots of different places. How did you manage to achieve that scalability to other places and locations around the world that other interventions have been grappling with? Yeah, well, importantly, by reducing its dependency on me. So with UCC, it doesn't need me involved at all now. It's completely open sourced. It's completely on Creative Commons. The, the training is online, so someone can pick it up and do it um, without having to involve me or our team in any way. And that's key. So to being able to deploy, uh, um, same for same for for health. We don't want to kind of get in the way of systems. We're, um, in 2023, we'll allow people to build their own programs. So a, a trust can come on board and say, okay, we want this element and this element. This element we want to deploy it in this way to these people. They don't need us to be involved at all. So we're a small team. We're 10 people uh, based in the UK. We're all everything that happens happens like on, on site with our team. And we, we focus on the processes and the content that is most valuable for us to be involved in and then make sure that people are empowered to deploy the things themselves. So that's the only way it's going to scale. Thank you. Yeah. One last question. Anybody else? Can I ask a question in that case? What, what are you doing in Bangladesh? I'm from Bangladesh originally. Yeah. And I also built a hospital in Bolivia in Santa Cruz okay, de la Sierra. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing in those two countries? I'd love to hear more. So uh, this was from uh, Youth Centre Community Against. So I'm a researcher, so I've always been interested in, in healthcare and society and the role of technology. And there, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not for a health, but the, the fundamental principles we learned there about um, creating content, which has got low need for uh, numeracy and literacy, and going to people where they are in local language and removing the researcher or the, the, the technology company from those situations. We disappear into the background and stimulate an environment where someone feels comfortable to say, well, for me, this is most important. In, in Bangladesh, we're talking about children in, in, in rapid onset emergency situations in displacement camps. So we said there's a million people currently living um, who fled Myanmar. And there, Save the Children and Oxfam use that process and technology to deploy and engage that population in a way that suits them. It's lessons learned from that that have informed for health. Uh, fantastic, amazing. Uh, last point, how much are you raising in January for what kind of equity? 
You never know. Yeah, so um, we're, we're very lucky to, be, um, to have generated revenues from the start. So we're a profitable company and we've bootstrapped for four years. So we haven't taken on any grant funding whatsoever or any investment. So, um, but we want to scale and um, we want to um, allow, re remove the barrier to people to work with us. So we need around two million pounds which will give us a bit of lead time to, to kind of take forward some grant funding as well. So two million pounds for, for, for equity in the business, yeah. There we are. So there's an opportunity. It's a profit business, yep. bootstrapped, yep. now it needs scale. That's not much. Let's hope we can raise that from our community over the next couple of days. Thank for you very you. much. Thanks, Ben, so much. And thank you, Georgina. Thank we'll you. We'll be at the back if anyone has <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, checkbooks are open as we speak, right? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Amazing. Thank you so much. Mm.